Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of having to settle for mediocre are over. Welcome to Project Relationship. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. Join me as I explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Let's go. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, and I'm here with my partner, Ken Hamilton. Hello. And we're talking this week about, well, getting what you want, which is, I think, a topic that is easier said than done. <laughs> it's not straightforward all yeah. the time. So how do we get what we want, and how do we get what we want in the context of a time when everybody's feeling a little bit more tender, and generally the, the stressors bring more stuff to the surface, all while we feel also there's this desire for mind reading at the holidays. Yes, there's these expectations that we think everybody else is going to know about and yeah. help meet. And... I think it's that, that, that magic feeling you talked about earlier. Yeah. That, like wishing that it could be magical. And it is magical, but <sighs> it's never yeah. going to be magic like it was when you were three or seven or whatever. Yep. If you were lucky enough to have an upbringing where there was some magic in your childhood, which and both I of was, us were. Yeah. yeah. And... I mean, we, we, there were those magic times. It's never going to be like that again as an adult because the, the curtain has been drawn back. Yeah. We, magic. yeah, we are the magic makers yeah. and I love that role, but it does still leave me in a spot. <laughs> the youngest child in me does not love that oh, role. Oh, and the oldest child it, in me so resents it, you. <laughs> would like it exactly. <laughs> And uh, and the thing is, I, I do. I want to make it happen, or I want somebody to make it happen. <laughs> want it to happen. I want it to happen. Um, and I think a lot of us feel a combination of those feelings. We want the magic to happen. We want to make it happen. We want somebody to make it happen for us. It's totally not clear to me how we got through all of our early communication snafus around this, especially when I think about the holidays, because in our early relationship, it was, <laughs> we did not understand what we were doing. We got a lot of practice. We got a lot of practice. On, on... Explicit yeah. versus implicit. Yeah. yeah. So, I think it'll go easiest if I just tell a story about this. Um, so our first Christmas together was, we were just starting to combine households. You hadn't quite moved in yet. It was a and very transitional time. It was, yeah, big transitions. Um, we were combining these all seven kids together. We had five cats combined at the oh time. Oh my God, we did. That's right. Um, this was a complicated relationship in which you were still married to someone else. I had just recently gotten divorced. Um, and the full story of that is, I know that sounds wild, but here it is. The full story of that is that it was a very complicated, very complicated. relationship that we thought we could all make work. We tried our best. We didn't necessarily succeed, and where we didn't succeed was mostly around this communication styles thing. It, it was a big part of most how of we the fell on our face. Wrong. Yeah, yeah. So my, that holiday for me was well. It was hard. I was sad. I was confused. Um, I, I was in my house, but we weren't doing traditions the way I was used to. I still, I, I still had a lot of baggage around Christmas anyways, because Christmas had been kind of messy growing up in my household. Um, and I, I didn't really know what to do with myself. <laughs> my extended family is also kind of your extended family because you were friends with my eldest cousin when we, I, I, we were all growing up. And so, so I had a lot of there was a lot of overlap. parallel experiences in places where you were. So from it was a normal for you to view, already so, be yeah. at some of the holiday functions and some overlap there. And I think I thought that that would make it all make sense or that something would make sense that year. 
and nothing made sense. Yeah. But the holiday wasn't really, it was okay. I was struggling through day to day, trying to figure out like just how to make divorced life work for me. And um, I, I broke open my actual piggy bank because <laughs> um, money was just, yeah, not happening. We had, um, we had started a business together, but that like it was still early days nothing and, worked and there was still a lot of communication issues i mean still yeah around money around too money absolutely business time relationships everything and i wound up feeling so alone that christmas this house was bustling with nine people in it 10 people in it 10 people and the grandparents, all the grandparents from all over the place, all all coming in and out at different times. And I felt so alone. It was really, really hard. I struggled in a way that I rarely do. I twice in our relationship, I feel like I completely lost my voice. I just like the the floor dropped out from under me and I no longer understood how to say the most basic sentences about what I need. And that feeling left me sure that I needed another tool, but not knowing where to turn. Because I, I am a clear communicator in general, and I am brave about asking for you what are. I want in general. But even the most courageous communicator can still have a time when she feels like her legs have been swept out from under her or him or them. I felt that way and it wasn't until after the holiday had passed and we got into spring and um, some things happened that I looked back on that Christmas and realized how tragic it had been for me. And um, the reason it was is because I didn't ask for what I wanted and it meant that we celebrated that Christmas sort of a away from my my family, which meant my mom yeah. and my dad and um, and then just a few short months, a couple short months later, my mom died. And it was very, even though she'd been sick my whole life, it was also very shocking. It happened very quickly because she was getting a kidney transplant, which had w gone perfectly. And then she crashed and she died very, very, in a very difficult way. So it was actually in retrospect that I remember looking back and saying, oh, I lost my voice. And in losing my voice, I lost my last Christmas with my mom. Yeah. If I had somehow had a tool to reach past that, whatever was, it was like, it was, it act, I could feel it in my mm -hmm. throat. Um, I could feel this, this lump, this, this hardness. If I had known what to do, maybe that would have gone differently. You know, it, it would never take away the grief that goes along with losing someone close to you. But, um, but certainly it, I would have a different memory. And we would have a different memory because yeah. I see the look on your face right now. I see how hard it is for you to hear this story. <laughs> and I know where I was in the story. And I know that one of the reasons that you lost your voice was it wasn't particularly working because you are an explicit communicator and the culture that I grew up by in. By training and by, by training, nature. nature <laughs> and my, my upbringing, my first marriage. So much of my life, um, I I took out of it that implicit communication was the way to go, which which I think is interesting because implicit communication relies on nuance and like under reading cues and and you know getting a sense of of context and what's happening. And I'm not good at that. It's not your but best it's what, skill it's set. It's not at all my best skill set and. Uh, it's what I was expected to do, and it's what I expected of other people. And so you would ask for what you wanted, and I would be looking elsewhere for the truth of what you really wanted. And it wasn't elsewhere. It was right where you were saying it was. And I would, and so you would say things, and they would just go past. Yeah. And so eventually, yeah, you lost your voice. You're like, what? What's happening here? I mean, I don't, I can't speak for your internal experience, but it looked like, well, what's the point? Uh, I keep saying it, keeps not happening. And well, so, I lost yeah. that, that tenuous thread. Yes. That tenuous thread between 
stating my needs very explicitly and having anyone even respond to right. them. It, it, I, and I started to feel invisible um, in my own home. And I started questioning uh, what we were doing at all. What Were we in a relationship? Because for me, explicit communication is tied very tightly to love. Now, that's not the only way that that can work. Some people really really do thrive in an, in a more implicit communication setting. Um, I, cu culturally, some cultures handle yep. communication differently. You know, I don't mind talking over each other. I like that collaborative, like building yeah. on each other's conversation. Like um, but you didn't when we first were together. We learned how to do that. It was uncomfortable because... Well, the thing I, I think that I had experience with a lot of other people who were implicit communicators and not very good at all the things that you need to be good at to be a good implicit communicator, reading cues, body language, tone of voice, all that kind of thing. And so it was necessary that there only be one voice at a time so you could read everything you could out of it. Yeah. When you, when you're, I hadn't my, thought of it that way. My experience yeah. with you as an explicit communicator is, yeah, we can both talk at the same time because it's just the words that are communicating. I mean, sure, there's a lot of emotional toning that happens beyond that. But the words are saying. But the some words stuff are too. saying true things, and it, it's possible to listen and talk for us in that way. So. And then there are moments when we do need to pause and make sure mm -hmm. that we're, yeah, that when we're, things get complicated. Yep, yeah, and that we're letting letting there be space and something that you were really good at um <laughs> even early was making space for me to get my whole thought out which was great except i could also talk myself around in circles sometimes you would leave so much space another skill of mine <laughs> that i would just i would keep talking mm -hmm. waiting sort of waiting for you to waiting add to the that. conversation mm -hmm. yeah. or waiting for you to respond to the request that i was making and it's like you didn't know that I had made a request. Like you because it was right there. It was like the the gorilla in those videos where um where you're supposed to be watching the people in like yeah. in green shirts yeah. and then a gorilla walks through the back of the video and, and you just don't see it. And you just don't see it because you were looking for green shirts. Right. Yeah. Like you you weren't looking for right. my explicit requests That's exactly. for say, like, I would like to go Christmas caroling. This is important to me. You weren't listening for nope, that. I was listening past. This is what I was saying before. Yeah. It would just go by because I'm listening past it for what you really want. Because I assumed that what you were saying was the thing you thought I wanted you to want. And I was looking for what you really wanted. Yeah, and I had no idea what the and heck was, was going yeah. on. And so you wonder why <laughs> I seem kind of dazed and confused so much early on. Yeah, I, was, I wasn't listening. I was looking, like trying to do a hundred other things that had no bearing on communication with you as an individual. Yeah. And be like, what are you, what are you doing? I just said. A lot of mind reading or attempting to read minds. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, we could have done better. <laughs> we really could have done a yes. lot better. And one of the things we could have done better, we could have started with um, some, some, some empathy for ourselves first, <laughs> like a little, a little self-directed empathy, a little, and then directed at, at each other uh, with the fact that we were in a time of deep transition, yeah. all of us, and that that was going to mean that nothing was really going to feel comfortable that year. Yeah. And that's where I find us right now. Here we are. It's 2020. It's still Nobody's the holiday season. <laughs> Things are getting more intense when it comes to like infection rates and stuff yeah. rather than less. Yeah. And yet we also, you know, we want to feel that celebratory, that mood. We want the magic. Yeah. And so what do we do? And I, I, I don't believe that this is our only tool, but I do think it's one of our strongest options is to not just have hard conversations because you know me i'll run headlong into a hard conversation i just love them that's like that must be my number one kink is hard conversations but <laughs> yeah it's, yep but i mean i like the the way we started formalizing our language and i know yes. it's a really common it's a really common thing we hear make i statements mm -hmm. but I, I we started taking it a step further and making very clear requests of each other that were that started with I like I 
would like you to. And so I, I lay it out in a template in the book. It's, you know, I would like you to blank when I, I would blank. Like to hear about I would like to hear. I would like blank. to do. I would like, I need help with blank when. So the template that is just the idea of getting really clear, but also leaving space in there for the fact that just because I need something doesn't mean you can give it at the time, yeah. but you can offer me the respect and the kindness of, 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 res of responding, of, of hearing me and understanding and understanding and, and ask. so reflecting back kindly. And you've yeah. gotten so good at that, even though I know it was hard for you to hear some of these, these needs and wants, sometimes it would be me saying something that I, I think felt, um, antithetical to you like it didn't fit anywhere yeah it took quite a while for me to adjust to an explicit communication style but i can say that there's one thing in particular that i found very beneficial for me and that was that with in talking to you i can retract a statement oh yeah i can say something and say wait that came out wrong or that was a first try and I, I want to change it or I didn't mean that at all. And you'll let me continue. And in my and particular- Try not to bash you with it. Try not, yeah. <laughs> and in my particular experience of implicit communication, it was something that wasn't actually possible. So if you had said a direct thing, then I it I said was, a direct thing. It existed. That, that's it. There's no, but there would always be somewhere down the line, but you said, and then I would, I, I wouldn't be able to work around it. And that was my experience. I couldn't even tell wow. you whether that was so what, what was going on for the other people involved, but that was That must have been really confusing for you when you were living with two of us who had these very different communication <laughs> yeah, styles. It was. And you're trying to adopt, like, or adapt to both of them. Finding a... Uh, I mean, I was there, but I, I still, like, it's really hard for me to bend my mind around what it might have been like to be you in the midst of that. We have talked about the difficulties, the struggle to uh, to have a conversation with two other people. So your so your a, wife at the time yep. lived with us, yep. and I lived with you, and we're we're asking for things sometimes in, things that are in opposition to each other. But even if they weren't, they're in completely different ways. And that happened lots of times because she and I were friends, and we often wanted the same things, yep. and. Yeah, but we wouldn't ask for that. I think you're we right. We wouldn't ask for them the same way. It was mind blowing. Yeah. So it what do you do with that? Cognitive, not even cognitive dissonance. I don't know what exactly it is. Emotional dissonance. Well, uh, yeah. So yes, but also I bet I bet you had like a somatic dissonance. I bet you felt it I in do. your body. Yeah. Because I see I it on your face right now. I can I can see you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of red and and your your shoulders are a little curled in and I can see that protective stance that you get when you're and because there were three of us communicating, yeah. you two had different communication styles and me, who at the time uh, had even a less strong sense of self than I do now, trying to figure out what's my communication style, trying to mix all those three things together did kind of make me want to. And all of us trying to be maybe better than we were. <laughs> right. Yep. I tossed my hat over the wall a little bit. That was a high wall. Yeah. And then just tried, we tried to make something work that seemed impossible. And maybe it was impossible for us then it was well, anyways. I know that now there've been so many, so many books that you have um, brought into your library. And so that I've gotten to look at, if not read that uh, around communication and communication styles, it would have been of huge value early on. So we made a million mistakes. We did. We made a lot of mistakes. Some we of hurt those, each other. We I mean, hurt each when we other. say mistakes, we should be clear. What we mean is we hurt each other. Yeah. Um, sometimes we hurt the kids. Sometimes yeah. I'm sure we hurt her. Um, I am sure that I hurt my ex. I'm I'm certain that I hurt my parents. Um, in in flailing around trying right. to figure it all out. And the holiday made it extra tender. Yes. It like again. that's it. That's the right word for me. It made it tender because of again the expectation. Everybody's looking for some magic, and so when when they get the opposite, it's a it's a big fall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that that is right now. I see 
I see our kids walking around sort of, well, I mean, they're, they're older. They're not little kids. They're not like waiting for magic like they would have when they were little. But I see them walking around in this weird 2020 miasma, not really expecting as much. Yeah. It, everybody seems a little braced. I wonder. Yeah. It is an opportunity. So you and I have been talking, we've been having these conversations and we're sharing them with the world, which is an interesting experiment. Unusual for me. Um, unusual for you, especially, because um, I am as transparent as I'll get out, but you have not had that same tendency. No, not at all. I struggle to see myself, yeah. let alone show other people. But here we are and we have the opportunity to practice communicating in ways that bring us closer together because that was the thing yes. the mistakes the mistakes and the hurts that we caused i don't think those were the end of the world i i do get choked up thinking back to that particular christmas and thinking like wow that could have gone differently and i would have had a different last holiday season with my mom okay yeah. that's true but but people get hit by buses and Illnesses happen and you, the world can sweep you off your feet in a second. That, that overwhelm is actually the norm. The, the opportunity I'm seeing is that we can, we've moved closer together by acknowledging, revisiting those times rather yeah. than pretending yeah. that they didn't happen. We, in fact, just talked about just that Christmas morning. just this morning on our walk. We talked about it and me getting to say out loud again, like, yeah, that, that was rough. That was hard. But also remind you that I don't hold it against you. I don't hold it against anyone. We were doing what we could do and we did, we banged up against each other and it made some memories that I wish that we, we had different ones. Yeah, for sure. But, um, but on the other side of that, was a set of conversations that actually, well, it was me saying finally, wow, I've never lost my voice before, but ouch, this isn't going to work. I got to do this differently. It was the harder conversations that were buried underneath um, and, and needed to be hauled out. Yeah. It wasn't easy. So what I find again in my experience is the explicitness. They're not easy, but you bring them up and you look at them. And this, I mean, I've, I've learned a lot secondhand from your, your depth psychological reading and talking and writing that I have read the, and bringing something up and looking at it, as really it looking at it as it Before is. Before you try to change it. Yep. Is is so has been so much better for me like I, I on a completely different plane of existence so much better than just sort of subtly acknowledging that it happened but moving on yeah it's like um squinting yeah. your eyes and getting past something right right like i yeah. know that happened but i'm gonna not really look at it yeah. ever again we turn and look back at these things and when we do Every time, oh God, I'm so, okay, I'm going to say the cheesiest thing ever. I fall a little bit more in love with you. I can also remember all the ways that you have changed, all the ways you've repaired, made repair attempts, the ways that we've turned towards each other, or the fact that sometimes I can, I can look at you and say, this is reminding me of that feeling. I don't want to go down that road again. Let's stop and try again. Yeah. Um, we also started the practice of having some more planned conversations. Yeah. Yeah. And we did that together, but I think I could have done this alone. I I had I talk about it with people all the time, with clients all the time. It's okay to practice your conversations. Sometimes we really have something that's literally challenging to get the words out. So I find that practicing like the first two sentences or three sentences, maybe even just the first one. Well, I use that trick when I'm storytelling too. Yeah. Figure out what the first line is and the rest of the story will tell itself. But if you practice that first line over and over, maybe on your way home from work or whatever, set the stage for a, a turning towards a, a, a moment together. 
And then do the check-in, my favorite check-in. I learned this from um, Kristen Chamberlain. I don't know who the first person is that said it, but before you have a hard conversation, check in with Halt. Right. Is either of you yep. hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? If you are, deal with those things first. We're just big toddlers. So if you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, halt and address those needs. Maybe that just means getting a snack and putting it down in front of you both and then have the conversation and that practice. Yeah. So it was when I could finally squeak the sentence out and say, I need, I need to be able to hold your hand in public. That's what I need from you. Sounds like a simple thing, right? But when I had lost my voice, that was the car that was actually the hard sentence. That's the thing I needed to say. I said that and everything changed. Yeah, everything changed. The same thing happened when we finally figured out that we wanted to get married. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a <laughs> funny story. After years of swearing that we would never do that and swearing maybe that marriage a, was like the e the end of the world. Maybe a little reactionary for my first marriage. Is... Might have been a little reactionary. Might have blamed the wrong thing. Might have blamed yes. the wrong thing. And I, so what you were just saying about hungry, angry, lonely, tired, I was thinking about, so we went up, went for a walk this morning. We were talking about some, um, some history that isn't not pleasant. It's not pleasant. Um, and it can sometimes be, um, attractive to like dive into those stories when there's a bad feelings already oh yeah but can. a really like good but, but that's and and i'm not saying there's no point to that but it's so much more to it if you can go into it strong if i'm yeah. going into it from a point of view of security secure in our relationship secure that you love me and don't hate me for all the things that i've done wrong then when we look at those things so that's i can be present a hundred percent for all the things that i did wrong for all the things that i wish i had done different even if you didn't think they were wrong i can be there for those things and if i'm those if I'm hungry angry lonely tired i can be defensive and and um, lonely is especially tricky ooh, yeah. because there you are standing with me. How can I be lonely? Yeah. Except lonely is an experience. It's an inner it's an experience. experience. And if you aren't feeling heard by me, if you're yeah. saying your things and I'm missing them because I'm looking that for that something said, else. that um, loneliness is being surrounded by people and still being alone? Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Like that. I think that you you hit on the way, it, the way that we worked around not having our voices, our respective voices during different times was mm -hmm. to start having these conversations when we were strong, yeah. setting up, setting a, a stage to have, okay, we're going to dive in. And I know that wasn't your idea of a fun vacation, but we've done some vacations like yes, that. Like, have. okay, this, this weekend is going to be, yeah, we're going to have sex and it's going to be fun, but we're also going to have some really yep. hard conversations. Get into it. And those have been investment times in our relationship and everything changes. It's, it's, that's magic. Makes the, uh, it, it can make the sex better. Okay. There's that too. Okay. We're talking about sex next, next time, time and next clearly time. we're ready to, yeah, we're ready. so yeah. Okay. This was really awesome. I'm so glad that we talked now. I know it's the end of the day. We usually are recording at the beginning of I'm the day. I'm glad we but did this now. Yeah. And this thanks for good. sharing your story. It's a. Uh, Thank you for one. listening once again to a hard one. And thank you all for listening to our uh, experiment in transparency <laughs> <Yes>. here. <laughs> Next time. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. In episode seven, we talked about how our totally different communication styles have been loads of trouble and surprisingly a huge opportunity for us to fall in love over and over again. Asking for what we want can be hard though. I shared how hard it was to feel unseen and unheard during our first holiday season together. And Ken talked about how it feels to face moments from our past that he isn't proud of and face them with strength and humility. I kind of love him more than ever for that. We haven't made an easy road for ourselves, but you know, every relationship has challenges that can seem insurmountable. How we communicate can be the pivotal skill that lets us rise to the challenge and find each other in the midst of the mess that we've made. 
We shared a couple tips for how we get into the hard stuff. We practice our opening lines, we check for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, and we remember to give each other a do-over when something comes out wrong the first time. Join us next time when we finally dive into my area of expertise and talk about sex. The holidays can be a time to get spicy and cozy, but in the middle of all this stress, who has the energy for sex? I've got you though. There is one conversation that can change the way sex and stress fit together in your life. So until next time, remember, relationships can be messy and that's good news.